which is Pat Conway uh, joining me, one of the founding members here of Great Lakes Brewery. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today. Yeah, I'm a co-owner with my brother, Dan. Yeah, and we're out here at the Ohio City Farm. Uh, that's the backdrop that we have, six acres mm -hmm. right here across from downtown Cleveland. You guys were one of the founding members of this farm, and you're still leasing and still using these, uh, this area for some of the hops and some of the spices and some of the food that you serve at the pub. Talk about how important that is for you. This well, it's, it would be ideal to live in a place like Napa Valley where we have, um, you know, 12 months of growing seasons. But, um, but we do take advantage as much as we can for the limited amount of time. But we actually started it down the street in a little plot called Kentucky Gardens, and they kept growing and growing. Then we did um, Hale Farm, which we have close to an acre, which we still do. And then now this is uh, in addition to that. So we're all about... Um, bringing food back to the inner city. There's like a food desert right now where you, a lot of inner city neighborhoods don't have high quality food. So this is an attempt to not only supply our own restaurant with food, but eventually to use this as a springboard for doing other urban gardens in the city. Let's go back to the beginning of it all. Great <coughs> Lakes Brewery. Where did that come from? Why did uh, why did you want to get involved in the, the beer game? And uh, it, did you ever dream that it was going to be what it's become today? Well, actually, the, the uh, genesis of the, um, the whole concept uh, was uh, through me. Uh, I had gone to school in Europe for a year in, in Rome, and not that Rome was the hotbed of beer consumption, but a, a brief uh, train ride over the Alps to Germany and Austria, Belgium, and then New e in the England and Ireland area. High-quality beers that were all fresh. They had these ubiquitous neighborhood breweries where the beer was made simply for that particular area. So not only was the, the flavors more lusty, but it was fresh. And the Germans say beer is um, like liquid bread. So the fresher you eat bread, the better it is. So the yeah. fresher beer is. So when I was in graduate school in Chicago, I was bartending and selling a lot of imported beers. And um, it looked like there was a change in the American palate because people are looking for more flavorful beers. But one thing that the European imports couldn't do is the freshness factor. So the idea was then to build a small neighborhood brewery like we had seen in Europe. So I moved back to Ch from Chicago to Cleveland after 15 years of living there. And my brother Dan was a, a loan officer at a local bank. And he looked at um, coordinating a business plan. And eventually he left the bank and we became partners. So that's how it all started. Did you think it was going to get this big? Actually, yes. Yeah. That's why we chose the name Great Lakes Brewing instead of Conway or North Coast. We wanted it, this to be the preeminent brewery in the Great Lakes region. You, you mentioned freshness. <clears throat> uh, so when we talk about a shelf life for a beer, in your ideal world, it's the next day. But there is, you know, best bu used by, that, that matters. Because oh. I know as a college kid, I, I didn't care. Like, you know, you gave me one that said it expired two years ago. I'm going to, you know, whatever I can get my hands on. But to someone that has this refined palate, that's on there for a reason. Oh, for sure. And I would say that um, we're a rare uh, breed indeed to, that actually puts an expiration date on each label. Yeah. If you go to the store, you'll see uh, endless shelves of linear feet of, of beer, and uh, I would guess that most of them don't even have an expiration date. So we do, and we, th we, we try to, to uh, adhere to as much rotation and um, um, attention to making sure that beer continually moves through the market because having a fresh beer is just like a, a religious experience compared to beer that's tired and old and stale. Yeah. I want to jump online here and see what sort of questions we may be getting in uh, online. Dan in Broadview Heights wants to know about any uh, thought in looking into the suburbs and expanding down there. We know you have an expansion right coming up in the Scranton Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Any thought on like a smaller version of the Great Lakes in a suburb at some point? Well, we've been approached by many communities around Northeast Ohio and actually many states, uh, you know, Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia, uh, Pennsylvania, to do other breweries. But we've decided to stay local, stay within the city limits, and be seriously the Cleveland's uh, major brewery. And so we're flattered that people ask us to go in different areas, yeah. but um, we think that our strategy right now is to just keep it local in within the confines of the city of Cleveland. The, uh, the expansion that is going on in Scranton uh, Peninsula down here, give me an idea on what that, in, in your head, and your vision, what that's going to look like when it's done. Well, we're still in the process of having endless charrettes about it because um, it's, it could be an enormously costly undertaking, so we're uh, going through a strategy of figuring out a way to phase it in. Okay. Because um, to do it all in one fell swoop uh, might be a bit, a bit much. Uh, so 
the better strategy is the strategy we've been following for 30 years, which is do things in increments and grow uh, year by year uh, in, uh, by adding this and adding that. And uh, I think if you saw us in this neighborhood 30 years ago, not only did the neighborhood look very different, our, our establishment looked different. So we kept adding rooms and different parcels. So that's how we're going to approach Scranton. And I think one of the big things uh, from, from that process is maybe getting the ability to do a little more canning, right? Yes, um, canning is, um, it's interesting, when we first started, there was kind of a pejorative feel about cans, and, yeah. and that's just, that's what my grandfather drank, and you know, there's a metallic taste that comes, that's imparted into the liquid, and, and but those days are gone, and now they've got much more sophistication uh, surrounding how to package with cans properly, and um, it takes sunlight out of the equation, because you don't have sunlight beating up the beer, uh, it uh, Weighs less, so you can put, and it's smaller, so you can put more on a truck for deliveries. Um, it's good because it's a more affordable package. Because when we do bottles, it's the crown, it's the neck label, it's the bottle, it's the uh, body label, it's the six pack, it's the mother carton. So the packaging costs are, are quite a bit higher with bottles. I'm gonna jump back here online and see what other sort of questions are coming in. Burning River Fest this year, 50th anniversary of the, the Burning River. Any big plans going on for that? Oh, for sure. Uh, it's, uh, it's the 50th anniversary since the river uh, burned in 1969 on June 22nd. So normally our, our festival is toward the end of the summer, so we're moving it to the exact date. Okay. So June 21st, 22nd, still at the Coast Guard, historic Coast Guard station. Uh, the event has been a stunning success for us and for the city and for the environment because we've raised over $750,000 that we dole out to various groups that work in the area of water quality and sustainability. And in the last couple of years, we actually earmarked dollars for the restoration of the Coast Guard Station itself, which you think is a stunning um, historic building. And at some point, we would like potentially to have some water quality uh, programming going on yeah. and maybe in water testing for the central basin. So. It's clearly uh, geographically linked to the river and the lake, but also um, that we could have some educational uh, pieces going on as well. Yeah, a f fantastic festival you guys Actually, do. you know, that, that uh, fire spurred all the great clean water legislation in the 1970s, and so, so much positive and, and came from that. And that's still kind of one of those black eyes on Cleveland, the people that don't live here. Mm -hmm. they, they, one of the things they think of is the burning river. Right. Well... We have one of our beers that's called the Brainer <laughs> Ale, so I guess we're <laughs> complicit in, in that. But, but I, we think that um, it was like Phoenix rising from the ashes. So much positive has is, is now occurred in these last three decades uh, in Cleveland and the water quality. Uh, hip fish habitats is, and various varieties of fish are coming back. Uh, eagles, uh, people building along the river, which yeah. they would not have done 30 years ago. Uh, let's go back online. Chris wants to know about coming up with the names of the beers and the artwork. How does that all get uh, get doled out? Well, when my brother Dan and, and I were um, brewers and managers and artists for the company, we were uh, very much involved with all of that. And, um, you know, it's not by any accident. One of the beers is called L.A. Ness because my mother used to be a stenographer, the Burning River Pale Ale. That's self-explanatory. The Dortmunder Gold actually was called the Heisman because John Heisman it. of Heisman Fo uh, Trophy fame's home is kitty corner from our brewery. So we thought that that great name and it associated with quality, but also uh, Teutonic and Heisman German. So the first beer we made was the Heisman, but then the Downtown Athletic Club uh, sent us a cease and desist letter saying we own the name uh, for uh, the Heisman Trophy and. and we had to back away from it, only to find out years later we could have kept the name. But by then, that horse had left the barn. It was Dortmunder. Gold. <laughs> Everybody knew it was Dortmunder at that right. point. Right. Uh, Conway Ale. That's Conway uh, your Ale. grandfather, right? He directed traffic right over here at Twenty uh, Fifth and um, and uh, Detroit. Uh, he stood in the middle of the street for decades with a semaphore that would go stop, go. And so he actually predated uh, uh, traffic lights. And um, my dad told me that his name was Patrick Conway. He had a plain deal in the press papers in his jacket as insulation because that wind would blow off the lake. Oh, but, yeah. But he was beloved, and uh, at Christmas time, uh, my dad told me that people would go by and hand him whiskey or chocolates or cigars, and at the end of his shift, he had gifts all around him uh, in the middle of the street. I thought that was pretty pretty romantic. You mentioned Christmas time. Your, uh, your Christmas sale is, is what a lot of people, I mean, that, that's a, a holiday to a lot of people when you guys tap the Christmas sale. Actually, you know, retailers uh, uh, have told us that we always know when it's Christmas time right around the corner because um, not only do you show up then with your Christmas ale, but then we start selling many more pies and cookies and everybody gets just flips into the Christmas spirit. Yeah. And so it actually extends to the, 
the whole variety of SKUs in the store. And, and now you see a, a lot of these other breweries coming along and, and kind of jumping on too. They have a Christmas version. And uh, is, is there market oversaturation at times? Do you think that's kind of like, wow, we, you know, it's it's nice to be emulated or, or whatever, but at some point you kind of think like, okay, this is an, enough breweries in Cleveland. Yeah, that's interesting that you brought that up because when we first started, there were seven dozen breweries in the country. Now there's over 7,000. Um, but when we first came out with Christmas ale made with ginger, honey, and cinnamon, it was it, it created the category. There were no Christmas ales. Now there's hundreds of them. Yeah. So actually, uh, we started to feel that from all the competition. But now our sales have started to go up like this. And I've asked our sales team to what do you attribute that, and he said. People have tried, tried, tried it, and they've now come back home because this was the original. This is what they really enjoyed, and so it sells like it's free. We love it. <laughs> what, what, what goes into creating a beer? You mentioned that one had the honey and the ginger. When you're starting from scratch and you're thinking of, and I don't know exactly, let's try to think of some of the newer ones, maybe um, the Moondog Ale or uh, the, the Turntable Pilsner. When you're dreaming one of these up, give me the idea of the process and what goes into this is what's going in it. Here's what the label's going to look like. This is the naming of it before it goes out uh, on the shelf. Well, it's a complicated process, and we don't take it lightly. So uh, at the round table are people, obviously, from marketing and sales, right? Then the ownership, because we're still active owners. Um, but we also have um, um, input from retailers that uh, who have given sometimes solicit, sometimes unsolicited advice about, you know, you guys, sh I think you should bring this to the market. And so... In that cauldron of stuff, we just um, ideas start to come, but uh, we do like the idea of um, trying to associate as much as we can with the city in Northeast Ohio, right. which is why the names always have something, some link to our history. But it's it's a complicated thing because the market keeps changing. And, yeah, you know what's new and what's different. And as brewers, it gets to be slightly brain damaging trying to uh, keep coming up with what's new and what's different. And of course, you also have to make sure it's all about quality too. You know? right. It can't be a frivolous undertaking. There's a lot of small breweries that are making things that are, are pretty appalling. Although there's a lot of small breweries that are making up beers that are quite stunning too. So it's you have, a mixed bag. Of you things. have some staples, and then you have a lot of seasonal. What does it take for a seasonal to maybe move into the uh, the former category? Well, I think that uh, the market dictates that. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, we've had beers on tap at the pub for years. Uh, we call them pub exclusives. They would only stay in the pub. You would never find them in the 13 states that we sell our product. But then you, it, it starts to develop almost like a cult following for that particular beer. So then you bring it out into the market, and, and uh, most of the time it, it exceeds expectations. Sometimes it flattens out because it went, hmm, we thought it was going to be more popular outside of the pub, but for many reasons it wasn't. But... I would say most of the time they're successful. I want to jump back here online and see uh, what other sort of questions may be coming in. Uh, Eric asks, is Elliot Ness's ghost in the basement of Great Lakes Brewing Company? <laughs> um, you know, these buildings were built in the 1860s, and there's been a lot of um, sightings, I guess, uh, from various <laughs> uh, parts of the, the campus, because there are all these. There, we have like six buildings, and all of them were built 150-plus years ago, so... Someone saw a woman up in the, the turret of the Elton building. You know, somebody else saw Elliot Ness's uh, um, um, shadow in the basement. You know, it could be the person say had too much Christmas ghost? sale or they've had too much Elliot Ness. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Is it at least a friendly ghost, you think? Or? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's so much positive energy in our space that's, um, that there's no nefarious evil energy in there. So, no, they're all good. Stephanie wants to know, it seems like every month there's a new brewery opening in Northeast Ohio. What is your relationship like with them? Is it friendly? Is it a friendly competition? Is it a, a back and forth uh, competition? Is it uh, mean-spirited? How is your relationship like with all the other breweries? Well, it, they, it certainly could be mean-spirited because you're all fighting for a market share, but we were more magnanimous. We like the idea of reaching out to other breweries, having them come in, um, uh, sometimes um, collaborate on different styles of beer. Uh, actually, when the, we had a brewer's conference here years ago, um, it was the National Brewers Conference, and it was Cleveland. And um, I, I was on the board at the time. The Brewers Association said, okay, if we're coming to Cleveland, you've got to be the preeminent brewery. You have to make sure everybody has a good time. So we had the opening party at our brewery, thousands of these brewers from around the country, and we made sure all the other breweries that were in the Cleveland were represented at a table. And we didn't have to do that, but we just thought it was a magnanimous gesture. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, all these awards, you're talking about these conferences, uh, there's a lot of these award competitions that go on and uh, you know people claim that they won this medal and they won this many craft awards or whatever. Do you enter all that? Do you, we're not entering that? How do you pick which type of tastings you go to or competitions you go to to enter? Well, the, the preeminent one is the Great American Beer Festival in Denver, and so we've won you know, dozens of awards there over the years. Some years you come back and, uh, without any hardware, and um, some obscure Colorado brewery might win one or two. It, it's kind of, uh, I'm not sure the logic behind it, because uh, I think all the beers we make are exceptional, and they should all win awards, but sometimes you don't. But I think that's the, the preeminent one. But there are many other ones, and I think, uh, again, our sales and marketing team starts to select which one we can go to, because then a lot of times it's in a distant city, and you know it's hotels and flights and personnel, so sometimes it's get expensive. You can't say yes to all of them. Right. Uh, I'm thinking sports. Is, this is a sports town, and a lot of times you guys have an association at Great Lakes. You have the, the John Adams, the, uh, the Rally Drum Red Ale, right? right. You have the, uh, the special Joe Thomas uh, can that was out in, in beer for a while. Anything in the works? I mean, I'm thinking the Browns uh, look like they may be destined for a, a great run this year. They got the draft tonight. Anything in the, the works with you guys? Well, we actually have struck a new relation, uh, a bigger relationship with the Cleveland Indians. Uh, we're the official beer of the Cleveland Indians, and our beers are poured throughout the, uh, the stadium. And uh, we have a, a, a real um, close relationship with the Dolans and, and the Indians. So that's, that's, that's uh, something that we've worked on. The Browns were there, but um, with the Brown with the um, the seventy three, the uh, Joe Thomas beer, yeah. we just are, are so small that we couldn't make the volume that everyone else wanted. But that's part of the reason why we're talking about expansion because we just didn't have enough tanks to produce a bigger volume. So any, uh, I'm trying to think of Indians, any Lindor style uh, ales coming out, or Jose Ramirez, or any Baker barrels for the Browns? Uh, anything in the works like that? Um, you know, we do some cheeky fun things at the pub like uh, we have one beer that's not in package but it's called the Red Rite 88 which was the infamous um, uh, play where Ozzie Newsom was intercepted and had we gotten the score we'd have on our, win, on our way to the Super Bowl that was um, that's part of the lore of the drive and the fumble Red Rite 88 was yeah. the name of the play so we had a reddish beer called Red Rite 88 but that's more just fun uh, uh, Brewing Good Initiative what's that about? Um, we have this, um, uh, you're talking about the cleanups and the, uh, um, this is a question online about the brewing good initiative that you guys are involved in. Well, we uh, enter various markets and we do cleanups and, uh, we, um, uh, river cleanups and yeah. planting trees. And so we'll go to a, probably a dozen cities, uh, around our, our target, our, um, territory and, uh, we ask each nonprofit to show up with like 50 volunteers, and then we'll give that particular organization $2,500, and then our staff is there with their volunteers, and at the end of their, their work of planting trees or clean up garbage, we, they have a celebratory glass of Great Lakes beer at the end of their, their thirsty day. But um, it's just our way of looking at uh, various markets um, of and beyond just billboards and ads. It's actually getting down grassroots, so to speak, and getting right into the neighborhoods and trying to make a make a statement about we're here for, for doing good as well. Yeah. Frank says Christmas ale sold out so fast in Florida in December. Is Florida going to be a regularly delivered state? Well, there was a, you really can't sell beer in states unless you're authorized uh, with a distributor and all the legal work behind it. But there's a caveat in the law that says a particular wholesaler can buy one truckload. And so that was the one truckload that uh, this um, Total Wines bought and they saturated the state and it sold like within an hour. And so they said it was probably the fastest selling beer that they ever got that, uh, where they were able to bring in one truckload. But um, that's also happened once in Arizona, I believe. And uh, it, did, it also sold like it was free. Because, you know, there's a lot of Clevelanders <laughs> spread around spread all over the, all place. Around yeah. the country. And in fact, one of the biggest bars in Chicago at this time of year is a Browns Backers bar, and it's just packed with ex Clevelanders. And having lived there for 15 years, there's some serious uh, energy out there for the Browns, even during their their horrible. So when you take like a, a, a Christmas sale and it goes to Florida or Arizona, one of these states that doesn't really have it, and it sells like that, 
do you guys go back and look and, and figure out, okay, maybe, you know, do we start crossing some of this red tape to distribute there on a larger scale? or? Well, that also has to do with our expansion because we really don't have <clears throat> enough volume to enter the state. But, uh, we, it's a great problem to have, though, I isn't know, it, Pat? <laughs> I know, but, it's, uh, but we know where it's sold, and we know that, for example, the west coast of, of Florida is more uh, uh, integrated with Clevelanders than, let's say, Fort Lauderdale, which is mostly Boston and New York. So a lot of Midwesterners go to the west side of the state. And so um, we, we, we tracked where that beer was sold, and it, it, it sold everywhere. But uh, there wasn't enough volume to make a, a, a final determination. But we do think um, that west coast is probably where you're going to find most Clevelanders. Uh, In fact, see. I was down there a couple of years ago, and I had a hat or a Great Lakes shirt on, and I was checking out some fish or beer or something, and the guy said, Great Lakes, he said, oh, dude, you got you would own this town if you would be. It was in Sanibel Island. So. Did he know that you were who you were? I made sure I told him. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Alicia wants to know if you're related to actor Tom Conway, who is a Willoughby native. Tim, not Tom. Tim sure. Conway. No, that was, uh, I remember those days when he and Goulardi, the, the two of them, uh, were uh, flying high, and we, they are the East Side Conways. And I would remember being at a cocktail party once, and the name tag said Patrick Conway, and someone said, are you one of the Conways? And I went, yes. I don't know what that meant, but I said yes. Now, you're, you're one of what, nine? Yeah, my brother and I are uh, two of five brothers, and we have four sisters. What's everybody else doing? Scattered around? Everybody is... Well, I lived in Chicago 15 years. I had a sister live in Minneapolis, another one in Boston and Detroit, and but now everyone's back. And in fact, uh, our son Emmett, who lives in Chicago, uh, is just bought a home in Lakeland. He's moving back, and so it's it's great to see family. With our our family reunions, and reunions are insane. I mean, there are hundreds of cousins. It's just. Is there any uh, younger generation coming up through the brewery business? Well, we have um, our son works for us in sales, but um, you know there's uh, nothing in the cards that says that he would continue on or not. But we this thing about establishing an ESOP is where we're looking to employees as um, being part of the company. Yeah. Uh, which beer are you most proud of? You mean besides Conway's Irish Ale? <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my, you know, it's just like wine or food. My, my taste changed with the season, so I, I drink uh, 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 redder, more red wine and, and darker beers in the winter. Um, and then in the summer, you know, lighter lagers like Pilsners and thirst-quenching ales. But um, I, I do think that we have a tremendous lineup of seasonals. Like uh, the Oktoberfest is considered one of the best uh, um, Oktoberfests in the country. Our Conway's Irish Ale people insist that we make it all year round, but no, we just put it in, put it out after Christmas. Um, I think um, um, our Edmund Fitzgerald Porter is probably the preeminent porter in the country, but I, I like um, like our Commodore Perry India Pale Ale is, is terrific. Um, it's it's more of a, our interpretation of, of, of an India Pale Ale. Yeah. If you go out west coast, they're far more hoppy and far more stringent finish, but uh, I think ours has got enough malt backbone that makes it a little bit more balanced and pal palpable. Um, is there a beer that you personally don't like that you guys make? No. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think there was. <laughs> uh, here, here's a question coming in. Uh, a lot of people now looking uh, at, uh, at like calorie count and carb count and try, some people getting very health conscious. Is there a, a, a an idea to go down the road into something that's a little more calorie conscious or carb conscious for you guys? Or? I think, you know, it's always good to have your ear close to the ground in terms of market conditions. And, and so, again, this has to do with our expansion because we just don't have enough um, to continue to keep expanding and expanding without enough land and tanks to do that. But, but we clearly want to hear what customers are thinking because... Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of good reasons why those things should be popular, right? Uh, I'm going to end with this, Pat. We, uh, we talk about uh, expansion a little bit, some things you're, you're, you're thinking about. Give me Great Lakes Brewery five, ten years down the road. Perfect world for you. What, uh, what are you guys doing? Well, you know, we, there's no law that says we can't sell nationally or even internationally. There's a lot of small craft brewers are, are, that are now starting to sell in Europe and Asia. But um, our, uh, there's no law that says we can't do the same. But we think that we should not be a mile wide and an inch deep. We'd like to get deeper into our own existing markets. And then 
if we need to add a couple more markets that are on the periphery of that. Uh, but um, the idea of freshness is always in the forefront of our minds and the idea of controlling your costs and increasing sales. Part of the controlling costs is watching your, your, ship, your shipping costs because the further you go afield from the, the uh, uh, um, smokestack of the brewery, the more costly it gets. So yeah. I would say that um, in an ideal world, if we got the brewery uh, to expand and we did it in increments and we were able to grow you know, another 10, 15, 20 percent, I think that would be a good day's work. You know what would help? Uh, the Uick lager that you guys are working on right now, right? Um, which one? After me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Just to plant the Christmas sale? <laughs> well, I don't know what's the plan, but maybe uh, ancillary with it or so. Pat Conway, uh, we thank you, and we thank you for being a part of Let's Be Clear.